Hello everyone, welcome. Today we're gonna paint this old world villa window. And I'm using my white Frederick's canvas pad, 12 by 16 as usual. And I'm gonna get started with my one inch flat brush. And I'm picking up a mixture of raw umber and yellow oxide with a little matte medium just to help me kind of blend it. Matte medium is not required for this painting. I use it mostly just because I like the texture that it gives the paint, makes blending a little easier, keeps the paint wet just a little bit longer. Now I want you to remember that all of the colors in this painting are completely optional. So if you don't have raw umber, use burnt umber. If you don't like yellow oxide, use ultramarine blue or whatever you have, whatever you like. You just want to give the wall a little bit of a structure to build off of. That's the purpose of this underpainting. If we tried to paint the wall just straight on top of the white, it would seem a little flat. It would be hard to cover all the white specks and give the wall the life that it needs. If you don't have a brush like this one, remember that you can always get my custom line of paint brushes on my website at paintingwithjane.com slash brushes. All right, now we're gonna let that dry. And I'm taking my ruler and I'm measuring out where I want my window. You don't have to be this precise if you don't want to. I'm bringing it two inches down from the top of the canvas. So I'm just marking out my two inch marks there. And then draw the line for the top of the window. Again, you don't have to be this precise if you don't want to. Now I'm gonna come in three and a half inches from the edge. I wanted it to be just off center, just barely off center. So I'm just gonna mark out a couple of spots that are three and a half inches from the edge of the canvas. By marking out the edges several times like that, you can be assured that your window edge isn't gonna be crooked. If I just took my ruler right here and drew that line, it could be crooked. So now I'm gonna draw the edge of the window and it's gonna be six inches. And then I'm gonna start marking out the other side of the window. I'm gonna make my window four inches wide. So essentially it's six inches tall, four inches wide, placed slightly off center. You can do that wherever you like on your canvas. It doesn't have to be in the precise place that I've put mine or even the precise size and dimensions. Just gonna add the other six inch line on that side for the left side of the window. And then just the line across the bottom, the line across the bottom doesn't have to be real precise because it's gonna be covered up by flowers and leaves anyway. But I wanted to put it there just so I knew where the bottom of that window was. Now I want some braces in the window for the panes and you can just freehand them if you like. I'm gonna go a half an inch right in the middle. So a quarter of an inch there and a quarter of an inch there for a half an inch. Same thing down here. And I'm just gonna continue kind of fattening up the frame of the window. I'm not being precise with this. I didn't measure this. I'm just putting as much of a straight line as I can. So you guys said you missed Mr. Moon and he's gonna make sure that you don't miss him after today's video. <laughs> I wasn't worried about these being real even since it's you know an old window, they might be a little crooked or off center or whatever. And these, I didn't worry about measuring them out. I just kind of put my ruler about in the middle, made some frames for the window panes at the top and at the bottom of it and called that good. We'll get the arch at the top of the window, just a little hint of an arch. And then I'm just gonna loosely mark in about where I want the bushes and flowers. This is just a reminder line for me. It's very sketchy, it's very transparent and thin. It will cover easily with paint, but I wanted to remind myself of how I wanted 
the plant to be shaped and the direction I wanted it to move. All right, I've got a little bit of ultramarine blue and some titanium white. I'm using my quarter inch angle here. I'm mixing just a little of that raw umber in there. Basically, I'm looking for a color that's just a little off white. There's a little hint of blue in there, a little hint of brown in there, but it's very, very light. And I'm just gonna start filling in the window frame. I don't have to be real precise with it here because I haven't painted the things around the window frame yet. So as you'll see, my window frame gets a little misshapen and then when I come back and do the things around it later I can cut into that and change it so a lot of you ask me sometimes why why do you paint the background after that's part of it you know if I painted the background and got the background looking exactly like I wanted it and then I come back and paint the frame on top of it and I need to make adjustments to the window frame then I have to paint into my background again potentially changing it and quite possibly even repainting the whole background. But by doing it in conjunction with the background in layers, I can make adjustments to both. So I'm not stuck with one looking wonky and the other one looking good, or one being completely redone. So that is the value of painting the background after you paint the subject. Again, this bottom part of the frame doesn't really matter. It might show a little bit through the plant. So I'm going to put it in there, but it's not going to show enough that if it's, if it's at an angle or it's weird in some way, it's not going to show enough that you'll be able to tell that. And then this little center part. I'm not going to worry about the little braces because those are very delicate and I know that I'll paint them over in the next part. So I'm just going to leave them off for now and we'll come back and, and fill those in at the end. All right, to my half inch angle and I've got some Payne's Gray, a little bit of raw umber, just so it's not, you know, completely uh, a a blackish gray. I just want a little bit of warmth in there. A little bit of white. It's a very dark color. And I'm going to start filling this in. Now, this part, it can be really easy for you to think of each of these panes as a completely different section, especially when we're painting them in the way that I am. I'm painting them in individually just because I don't want to lose that line. But don't think of these as individual. Each one can be reflecting part of the one below it. You know, pretend like those, those lines, the horizontal lines aren't even there. The only reason I'm skipping them is so I don't lose them. But I'm going to take this color up into the next section as well. If you paint each one a, a completely different color, it's going to feel weird. It's not going to look like it's reflecting the world around it. So I'll show you what I mean here in just a second. And I actually do a couple of layers. So by the end, it does kind of look like it's reflecting maybe some trees in the sky, but it's not three separate squares of different colors. This is that same dark color. Notice how I'm changing the shape of the frame just a little bit. I'm gonna take a bit of that color up into this window pane and kind of break it up. Same thing over here. Change the shape of that window frame a little bit and just get a hint of this dark color in there. It's reflecting something out in the world. 
a little more white, a little more blue. Mix it into that color. And I'm going to fill in the rest of this square. Let it blend with some of that dark color. Let there be hard lines between them. We don't know what it's reflecting. So it doesn't matter if you have brush stroke marks in there or not. I'm probably even gonna take a little bit of that color down into the lower window pane. And if it's just easier for you to paint over those lines so you don't end up with three squares of different colors, then, then do that. See, just take a bit of it down there. And let's go lighter, more blue, more white. And we'll start filling in this top square and I will be taking this color down into lower squares. And when I do the next layer, I think it, it looks a little bit more like window reflections. Right now it is kind of, you know, blocky and <laughs> separate looking, but that's, that's what layers are for. That way you don't have to worry about getting something, you know, quote unquote, right the first time. You don't have to worry about making something exactly the way you want it the first time. You can work in little layers. Just get it good enough, come back to it later, make it a little bit better, come back to it later, make it a little bit better, and keep going until it's exactly what you want. And I like that a little bit of that underpainting is showing through on the window. Just kind of helps, you know, give the illusion of other things reflecting or maybe you can see into the window a little bit, into the room. I did let this dry completely and I'm just mixing up the exact same color mixtures and applying it again. Again, focusing on adjusting the window frame where I need it, getting some good texture with my brush strokes. I'm not painting over that first layer completely. I let those little transparent bits show here and there. See that? It's just very loose. And it's okay if I paint into the window frame a little bit because I'm not done with it. There's that lighter color scumbling into there. Make sure you get some up into that top frame, maybe a little down into the bottom frame. And a lighter color. Never be afraid to blend with your finger. And that's a pretty simple way to do reflections on a window. You don't have to try and, you know, make trees or just paint it black, which would make it feel very flat and empty. Just scatter some, some kind of grayed out colors on it and that's really all you need to do.
All right, I'm gonna go to my 5 8 inch filbert. I've got my ultramarine blue and some cad yellow medium. Again, I'm just using matte medium for my own preference. I like the, the texture it gives to the paint. It makes it very smooth. It makes it a little bit tr more transparent, which I kind of like right here. I mix this color up quite dark, so it's very heavy on the blue. And I'm just kind of lightly scumbling in where I see those pencil lines. I'm not trying to make leaves or any detail in here right now. I'm just getting that color on. It's just my base color. And if I don't like any of these shapes, once I start painting the wall, I can paint them out. So you don't have to worry about, you know, oh no, I made it too big or it's too pointy on this side or, you know, I got an errant brush stroke that I don't want to have anything there on this side. Just kind of explore that shape, figure out where it's going to be, how big it's going to be, and then paint out parts you don't like when you start painting the wall. Keep the shape interesting. Don't make it just a big ball. You know, if it pokes out really far on the left, make it not poke out so far on the right. If it stands up really tall on the right, make it a little bit lower on the left. And see how I've got it kind of pointing off to the left at the bottom there. I'm onto my half inch flat now. Some burnt umber, some Payne's gray, some unbleached titanium, which you could just use titanium white if you like. I like kind of the, the warm vintage type look that this color gives. You could even use parchment or golden makes a color called Titan green that is really close to parchment. You could use that. And I'm very gently scrubbing this color on I'm using a lot of scrubby motions, a lot of kind of hash mark style brush strokes. So up and down, left and right, but I'm using a light pressure. So I'm loading up my brush pretty good, but I only put heavy pressure on when I want to get a blob of paint off. And then it's back up onto the tippy toe of the brush to kind of scumble that out and spread it around. So, by doing that, I'm making sure that some of that warmth from the underpainting is showing through. See some soft pressure there just to kind of start scattering that on. Heavy pressure there to lay down a thick amount of that paint. And I'm just going to work the paint on that brush until nothing else is coming off. And then I go back for a little bit more. Same thing around here. Now I did let the green dry because I didn't want to pull any of the green into this grayish color. But I'm going to work right up to that to the edge of that green. And if I cover some of it, it's okay. But I'm gonna go right into it. I'm not being overly exact. Don't try to paint exactly around the green. I see that so often where people, it's like you're afraid to cover the green. You're afraid to touch the green. And so you paint this gray color directly to the edge and it makes the green feel very cut out. Don't do that. Just pretend like it's not really there. Scumble around it. If you overlap it, that's perfect. You know, if you paint some of it out, you can put it back if you want it. But just get in there. See, I'm overlapping and painting out some of that green. And, and sometimes I don't get all the way up to it and it leaves a little gold halo around it. All of those things are fine.
you can make little notes to yourself while you're doing this, you know, reshape the bush, you know, take the gray really far in to remind yourself that you want the, the flower bush to be a little bit smaller on one side or leave the background showing in another spot to remind yourself to fill that with the flower bush later. Thought about maybe leaving a little spot there, but ultimately it does get covered up. Sorry about that glare. I'm gonna throw a little more raw umber in there and the white. I'm just changing that color a little bit here. That's actually the titanium white. So this color is gonna be lighter and browner than that color I just did. And I'm gonna start doing the exact same thing. That looked a little stiff to me, so I do start kind of scribbling in random directions a little bit more. And you guys know how I love a good scribble. See, that just looked really tight to me. But again, I'm not trying to cover all of any of the layers. The last layer is still showing. The base coat is still showing. And time to scribble in random directions. And I love seeing those brush marks. That really helps add to some texture on the wall. When you're doing this color, you don't have to cover the entire canvas. You know, you can keep it into one area or, you know, just do it in a single spot. Don't feel like you have to take each layer over the entire canvas. Make a decision to leave it off of a whole section of the wall. It's just gonna help add to the aged look. If you take every color all over the entire wall, it's just gonna seem kind of flat and a little bit lifeless. But you know, if it's lighter at the top and darker at the bottom, or you know, one corner is quite bright and the opposite corner is quite dark, you know, just scatter it around, it's gonna seem much more exciting. I'm really scrubbing this brush. <laughs> Don't be afraid to scrub your brushes. You know, I hear from a lot of people that they're afraid to scrub their brushes, their brushes because they don't want to ruin them. But, you know, that's what a brush is made for. It's made to be used. It's made to be, you know, put to work. So put it to work. The nicer you are to your brush, the tighter your painting's going to be. And if you feel like you struggle you know, with tight paintings, then loosen up and, and scribble. Really grind that brush into the paint. Brushes can be replaced. I'm gonna go a little bit lighter. I just mixed some pure white into that same mixture. It's almost just pure white. And I'm gonna start scumbling a bit of this in. But notice I didn't take that light color into the corners at the bottom. I just stopped. And I'm gonna do that with this color too. I'm just scumbling it around very loosely and it's not going everywhere. I'm really just picking up white at this point, but I'm scrubbing it so thin that it doesn't look pure white. Right, a little more raw umber and Payne's Gray. A 
little matte medium. I do want to make this a bit more transparent, but you could just scrub it if you want. And what I'm doing is kind of glazing this bottom area with these colors. So I'm spreading it very, very thin. The matte medium makes it easier, but you could do it just by scrubbing as well. I'm just darkening this up. I really played with the texture on this wall for a while. I'm gonna pull it up the side there. I really liked that. And put some of it down here and pull it up the side here as well. Nice and dark right there under the bush. All right, little Payne's Gray. I didn't clean off my brush. I'm just gonna add a hint of a darker flavor of that color at the bottom. And I'm gonna go back to my base color, that brown and yellow. We're gonna start filling in the arch. Now this arch is kind of recessed. So it's, it's gonna help us push the window into the wall just a little bit. And really, I could have I put a little bit more attention into this, so maybe you will learn from my lesson. And you put a little bit more attention into it than I did, but I'll show you what I'm talking about. So I started filling this in and I realized that wasn't quite dark enough. So I'm actually going to add some Payne's Gray to it in just a minute. Grab some Payne's Gray and put that in there. We do want this nice and dark. Again, not overly concerned with the shape of the window frame. So I've cut into it a little bit, made it a little bit wobbly, but it's okay. Okay, back into the titanium white and my quarter inch angle. And I'm gonna start working on the window frame a little bit more, kind of adjusting the shape, taking a little bit more care here with the shape of it. But I'm not painting over all of it. I'm gonna use that kind of grayish color that I put down the first time to start acting like the, like the shadow color. So it's hard to tell in the video. It really looks pretty similar, but there's a bit of difference there in the base white and the white that I'm using now. So I'm just gonna take my time and work on the shape, tweak any little areas that, you know, got really weird <laughs> and bring them back. But again, like I said, it's an old window frame. So if it's a little wobbly or wonky, it really doesn't matter all that much. Just so long as it's 
basically right. Sometimes we worry too much about, you know, that ugly word that I always hate, perfection. So, you know, if you're one of those people who gets really hung up on that, you know, or says, oh, well, I'm, I'm a perfectionist. And so I have to keep, you know, working at it to make it perfect. You got to learn to let that go. Being, you know, a perfectionist is going to hold you back from being an artist. It really is. You know, there's, there's no such thing as perfection. There isn't. You know, perfect to who? It may be perfect to you right now, what you're aiming for, but I bet you could take a painting that you do today that you think is perfect, and in six months or a year down the road after you've been painting more, look at it and see that is not perfect. That is absolutely not perfect. Likewise, you could do something today that you think that is horrible. I hate that and put it away and three days later or a year later, whatever, look at it and think, what was I thinking that is perfect? That's exactly what it needs. I just darkened this a tiny bit with some blue and a little bit of Payne's Gray. You know, and my perfect might be different from your perfect and your perfect is going to be different from the other guy's perfect. And nobody, there's nobody in the world that sets the standard for perfect, you know? So you, if you're chasing perfect, where does that standard come from? What is it that you're actually looking for? Because even your perfect is going to be different from your perfect, you know, with a little bit of time. So paint and enjoy. That's, that's what it's all about. And if you're not chasing that elusive perfect, you're going to learn so much more. You're going to enjoy so much more. Painting is so stressful and horrible when all you do is focus on you know, quote unquote, perfect, that doesn't even exist. So, you know, just enjoy yourself. I can't tell you how many times I've done a painting that I hate and somebody else loves it. And I point out the things that I don't like and they're like, no, that's what I love. That, that's perfect. That's exactly the part that I love the best. So just don't be hard on yourself. Just do it and have fun. Rant over. <laughs> I just picked up some pure white. It's still a dirty brush. I'm still just reshaping and adding some bright pops to the, you know, just parts of the frame. Notice it's very subtle. I have shadows in there, but they're pretty pale. And I'm going to add a little bit more shadow to the top of the window frame in a little bit. But right now, this is all I need for, for right this moment. Just dashing that white on. And this pure white that I'm using, I'm using it a little bit thicker than I did before. Sometimes, you know, if you're having a hard time with white and you think my highlights aren't popping enough, you might be spreading the white too thin. Let that white be nice and thick. That's how it's gonna stay nice and bright. And now I can take some pure white and just add those little braces. Still using my quarter inch angle. And if, again, if they're a little wobbly or wonky, that's okay, it's an old window.
I didn't feel like these little braces needed much of anything else, but if you wanted to get really detailed and go in there and make the bottom of them, you know, darker and the top of them brighter, you could do that. I figured they were so small that doing that would kind of lose them in the window panes and it might just make them look, you know, too small or weird or whatever. So I just did the white and I feel like that's really all they needed. Just another little pop of some really thick, pure white right there. Into my Payne's Gray. Experimented with making those shadows a little bit darker, but I didn't feel like it was necessary. And again, I felt like it kind of made it blend into the the window glass a little bit. So if I were doing this again, I would probably skip this part. I feel like it looked fine without it. But it is just a subtle amount of this color that I'm putting on. And if it's a little aggressive for you, you can just take some pure white and, you know, push it back in a little bit. And that's actually what I'm doing there. I just grabbed some white, dusted it over. I didn't lose it altogether, but it, it just kind of kicks it back in a bit. Made that shadow a little bit stronger there because it's being covered by the plant a bit more. All right, I cleaned off my palette. This is actually day two or three. I worked on this for a few days. I'm back into the raw umber and yellow oxide with some Payne's Gray. That's my quarter inch angle. And I decided what this needed to push it back into the wall is to take that dark color and run it down the edge of the window. And this is what I was talking about before where you should learn from my lesson. I feel like I should have done this a little bit more, made it just a little bit wider, a little bit more obvious. And it's, I feel like it's fine for the most part when I'm done here, but then later I paint it out really. But if I were you, I would take this color a little bit heavier down both sides. That's just gonna help kind of push the window back into the wall a little bit more. It's on this right side here where I end up losing it. I don't think you can see it at all really in the finished painting on this side. I'm going to put a bit more of a shadow with some Payne's gray and white just right at the top of the window frame. That's going to indicate that the wall above it is poking out ahead of it and casting a bit of a shadow down on it. Again, just little hints of white to blend that color in a bit. A little tiny bit darker. Being very streaky with this shadow color. I like streaks. I know some of you don't like brush stroke marks, but man, you made the painting with the brush. It's okay if it looks like you made it with the brush. And canvas texture, 
You painted it on canvas. It's okay if it looks like it was painted on canvas. Just blend it down the edge, just a hint. And we're gonna be done with the window frame for good this time. <laughs> back into my half, back with my half inch angle, I'm gonna get a good amount of water on it. See how I just shook it off? I'm gonna get me some Payne's Gray. I don't want the paint to flow and run, but I want it very, very thin. So I'm mixing the water in my brush in with that paint until it's just about the consistency of very thick ink. Very thin, but not runny. And I'm gonna flick some of this dark all over the wall. If it gets on my window, I'm just gonna wipe it with the side of my hand. I'm not gonna you know, freak out or worry. If it gets on the bushes, I'm not worried about it at all. That's all gonna be covered up. So I'm just holding it about two inches, three inches from the canvas. I'm flicking. So you just wipe it away with your hand if it gets on the window, it's not a big deal. It's just all about texture. Back to my yellow oxide and raw umber Payne's Gray mixture and my quarter inch angle, tiny hint of white. I'm gonna add some bricks into the wall. I like the look of you know, kind of that plaster schmear on a wall where you've got some bricks poking out. And so all I'm doing is just very loosely indicating some shapes so that it's more like rocks that are stacked, not very even bricks. And every time I go back for more paint, I'm gonna completely change the color because it's a rock wall and each of the rocks are gonna be different colors. I do glaze it later with Payne's gray, and then they all end up quite dark, but these little bits of different color underneath do help to change it a bit. Just make them go all different shapes and directions and sizes. As you'll see later, I actually did put these these rocks all over the wall in different places, but I end up painting out quite a few of them. So I'm only gonna show you the ones that I kept in this video, but you'll see me painting over others later on. So see just a little clump of a few, and then I'll come over here and mix up different colors and put another little clump of a few right to the edge of the window there. I'm gonna to go to my Fuzzbert, which is my old fuzzy scrubbed out number eight Filbert. Use whatever kind of brush you're comfortable with scrubbing and just a small brush. I got all of my wall colors there and some unbleached. I'm gonna go pretty light. And I'm gonna start scrubbing some of this color in. I'm gonna get between the rocks a little bit. It's okay if it covers them up a little, you know, because this is, like a schmear right on the wall. And so when it was applied, it might have overlapped the rocks a little bit. If you paint a rock out, you can put it back. So don't worry about that. Get it in between those rocks, scribble it loosely around the rocks, thicker in some places, thinner in others. Don't try to cover all of those layers and, and get rid of them.
Just some pure white on that dirty brush. Tiny hint of unbleached. I just like to change the color whenever I go back for more paint. I love scrubbing and scribbling. It's so freeing. If, if you're uncomfortable scrubbing and scribbling, I really recommend you try it. Especially if you struggle with really tight paintings. Like if you, if you want to loosen up and you feel like your paintings are very tight, let yourself do some scrubbing and scribbling. I'm just going to keep that edge right there very sharp and then scribble it out to the back. I love how the texture of the canvas is really showing. That's going to help, you know, keep some life and texture in that wall. That's why I like textury canvases. I like a medium texture canvas. Super smooth canvases are really nice to paint on if you're doing something like a portrait. But if you're doing, you know, something like a, a still life or a landscape or, you know, a, a building scene like this, I think that canvas texture lends so much life to it. Again, just that dark color with some unbleached, so it's a little bit lighter. And I'm going to start adding just a hint of a darker color there. I want it to kind of start fading from a lighter color at the top to a bit of a darker color at the bottom. See how I'm just spreading that color really loosely? I'm not covering everything and I'm getting brush stroke marks. That's how I think I'm keeping, you know, nice texture in the wall. Not just making it look fuzzy and scrubbed out, but it's creating texture. Just a little bit of white to kind of bring a hint of that down in here too.
One important thing to remember when you're doing the scrubbing like this is don't use too much paint. You know, I load up my brush with a decent amount of paint, but if you pick up huge globs of paint, you're gonna have a really hard time spreading it around without just covering up and obliterating everything underneath. So just be aware of that. Your, your brush should be coated, but not globbed on. And here you can see those other bricks that I just kind of messed around with. I put them in a few other places knowing full well that if I didn't like them, I would just paint them out. So all of those that are even with the planter and below, they're all going to get painted out. And I'm just darkening that color as I, as I come down farther. especially right under the plant. I'm gonna come back and, and really darken that up. In fact, it looks like I'm gonna do that right here. Darken that up because the plant would also be creating a little bit of a shadow on the wall. So we would have you know, some weathering, which would create some of the darkness, but also then the shadow from the plant. Still wasn't sure if I was keeping those bricks or not, so I'm going around them a little bit, but pretty soon I decide, nah, they're out of here. If you don't have a fuzzbert, any kind of a little scrubby brush, maybe just pick a brush that's kind of lost its edge, or even a brush that you just don't use a lot and just start scrubbing with it and if you're nice and aggressive with that brush it won't be long before it's just puffed out and old and they get better and better at their job the more you scrub with them this brush I've been scrubbing with this bad boy for a couple years now and his head has fallen off before because I get pretty aggressive with him but you know I keep a bottle of wood glue in my studio so that whenever an old brush's head falls off, I just glue it back on. Wood glue is really good for that. So I do recommend you keep a bottle of that around, but I, I do not spare this brush in any way. He gets just scrubbed to death. But like I said, a brush can be replaced. I have a nice number eight filbert, which I'll be using shortly. And I've got my scrubby old puffy filbert, which honestly is one of my most used brushes. I use this brush a lot. So you remember how I said, don't take a color over the entire thing. I'm pretty much, I, I really didn't do that bottom corner at all with this brush. I just left it. The difference in texture and color is just gonna help add to the personality and the weathering on the wall. <laughs> Still cutting around those ugly little bricks that I'm gonna paint over. And that's about all of it for Fuzzbert today. I'm gonna to go to my number three round, and this poor little brush is probably gonna end up being a fuzzy guy soon too. I do a little bit of scrubbing with him here, not too aggressively, but a bit. I'm just getting kind of a light color, just mixing up my colors until it's light. Getting in there and scrubbing some of that lighter color between the, the rocks here, kind of shaping the, the plaster on the wall around them. And then I do go flat foot pressure with it here, as you can see there, and kind of fuzz that color out a bit. That helps me keep a lot of the texture of the canvas and it fades the paint out. So again, you don't want to pick up a big glob of paint. My brush is fully loaded, but there's no globs of paint. Picking up a glob is going to make it really hard to get that nice kind of foggy textury look. 
but don't be afraid. I am not going to scrub this whole background <laughs> with this little number three round brush. I'm really just kind of cleaning up around the bricks and that's really all I'm doing here. If you have a set of nice brushes that you have no desire to ever scrub into, you know, go buy yourself a set of those like really inexpensive brushes that you can get at a craft store, like nine bucks. And there's like, I don't know, something crazy, like 25, 40 brushes in it. Just really cheap brushes, really cheap, not very well made brushes have their place in your toolbox. I promise they do. So, you know, if you have my brushes, for example, and you don't want to ruin them and you don't want to have to buy more, I can under understand that. So go get a value pack of cheap brushes to do your scrubbing with. But it's really important, I feel like, and for the way I paint especially, it's really important to have those brushes that you can just beat up. I'm almost done with these rocks, I promise. See, I cut that one into two different rocks. So as you can tell, the vast majority of this painting is <laughs> really playing with the texture and the colors on the wall. I felt like next to the flowers, the the color and the texture in the wall was the next most important part in the painting because it really helps, you know, set the mood for the painting and give you that feel of an aged building that's got some history to it. And so I wanted to put a good amount of time and energy into that wall. You know, otherwise you could just paint it a solid color and maybe have the window and the flowers be what stands out. And the wall is really just there for, you know, a, a surface for them to exist on. But for what I was trying to get across, the, the texture and the age of that wall was really, really important to it. So I know it seems like I should be putting the energy and the time into something else rather than just layer upon layer on the wall. I felt like that was exactly what I needed to do to get the look that I wanted. Just cleaning up that edge. Yeah, see how I lost that dark line on the right hand side of the window frame. I feel like the recessed area would be a little bit more convincing had I left that line on the right side. So just make sure you've got that on yours. This is kind of a muddy, darker color. The matte medium helps here because my paints are starting to dry out. So a little matte medium kind of helps re-wet it. And I'm gonna do the same thing around these other rocks. I'm not mixing this color up quite as light as I did on that top area with the rocks because here we're starting to move down into parts that are a little bit darker. So I left this just a little bit darker. You could even do the rocks and I thought about doing it this way, but it just felt like way too much work. <laughs> I like to take the path of least resistance. 
but one thing I thought about doing was doing the rocks all the way around the outer edge of the window. You know, sometimes you see that where you see how the rocks build the structure for the window frame and everything else is, you know, the stucco or the schmear or whatever on the wall, but you see the rocks all the way around the edge of the window frame. And I thought about doing that, but ultimately I just really wanted to focus on the texture of the wall and just have a few rocks to kind of drive that point home that there's some rocks in that wall. So that's why I chose to do it this way. If you wanted to really spend your time and just do the entire wall like this with the rocks, I mean, it would take some time. You would definitely have to be patient and, you know, not try and get it done in an afternoon, but you could definitely do that. So like I was saying, matte medium is really helpful if you're like me and you, you'll paint, you know, work on a painting all day long and your paints start to dry out on your palette a little bit. If you just pick up a little bit of fresh matte medium when you go to get your paint, it does kind of help re-wet it a bit and it's different than using water. So the water, I feel like when the paint is drying and you bring a little extra water to it, you can almost see the pigment separating right there. It starts to look a little grainy. It's very, very transparent. It doesn't actually flow any better. It just kind of gets lumpy, but the matte medium seems to smooth it out just a little bit more and make it a little easier to use when it starts getting dry and clumpy on your palette. I am back to my quarter inch angle. I've got some Payne's Gray and some matte medium, and I'm gonna kind of glaze a bit of this Payne's Gray over the rocks. I'm not trying to cover them completely. Some of them will get a heavier amount of the Payne's Gray. Some of them will have spots where the Payne's Gray isn't. I'm just trying to darken them a little bit. I decided I didn't like them quite that light. Now I'm gonna get a little bit more of that raw umber. No matte medium, so this is a bit more opaque. And I'm gonna put some of this on as well. Again, not trying to cover everything. Can change the shape of some of the rocks if you need to especially with that raw umber because it's much more opaque than the Payne's gray I'm going to just quickly do the same thing on these rocks and then we're going to move on
There we go. All right, we are done with the rocks. Now we're gonna move on. I'm gonna get some more panes, some more raw umber. I've got my half inch flat still. Just gonna darken up some of this, paint out those ugly rocks. This is another brush that I've dedicated for scrubbing. This is my old puffy half inch flat. I have a nice one that I use when I need to be a little bit more precise or when I wanna do nice blending. But this is my old one that I can just scrub, scrub, scrub with. I am sparing nothing in my scrubbing with this brush. And again, it's, it's another one of those ones that I've had for years and the more I scrub with it, the better of a scrubbing brush it becomes. And see, I didn't scrub that color over everything on the, on the bottom half there. Grab a little unbleached, mix it in there so it's just a little bit lighter. Tiny bit lighter. A little matte medium. Sometimes paint, when you work really thin like this, it can be really hard to move around. And again, that's, what, that's one of the things that I think the matte medium uh, makes a little bit easier, but certainly it's not required. Just remember that if you're using extra water to spread your paint very thin, you could underbind your paint, and then the next layer you come back with, you could remove the paint below. I'm just touching up a couple areas. I'm just picking up some pure white and just scattering it in there. And then I promise we are gonna be done with this wall very soon. It feels like we've been painting this wall for forever. But if I were painting this for myself, I probably would have kept going. I probably would spend at least another hour on the, the texture and the colors of the wall. But, you know, sometimes I try to cut things a little short for videos because it's got to be boring for you to watch me do the same thing <laughs> over and over. 
I'm sure at some point you're like, oh no, she's not doing another layer on the wall. I put a little extra water in my brush there again and picked up some unbleached. And I'm just flicking some of that color throughout the darker area. And again, I just wipe it off with my hand if it gets on the window. You can't really see it higher up, so I didn't bother. And then I'm going to do the same thing again with some Payne's Gray because I lost a lot of that before and I really liked it. You can still see some of it, very pale traces of it through the, the scrubbing and the layers, but I just wanted a bit that was still on the surface and a little bit more obvious. I applied it pretty thinly though. I didn't, I don't want big, huge black polka dots throughout everything, but I just put a little suggestion of it up in the lighter areas. All right, I'm on to my number eight filbert. This is my nice, fresh number eight. I'm gonna get some ultramarine and some cad yellow medium and mix up a green that's a little bit lighter than what I've already got on there. And I'm gonna start defining the shape of this plant a little bit more, kind of dashing the color in. And I was experimenting with my brush strokes, so you can kind of tell I'm not sure what I want to do at first. And then as I work my way down, my brush stroke starts to take on a very deliberate look. Just changing the color a little every time. So what I end up doing is like there, I just kind of scrub in the interior and toward the edge of the plant, I start doing this kind of little dashy swoop. So I'm using the edge of my brush and kind of pulling outward so it makes a little leaf shape. So just scrubbing in the interior and make those little dashy swoops with the edge of the brush to create a leaf shape. Make sure your leaves go in all different directions. That's going to make it really dynamic. See the little swoops there? It's a little easier to see where the color's a bit lighter. And I move around. Notice I'm jumping around. I, I start putting color in this one spot and then I'll just stop and go start putting color in another spot. That helps me keep from kind of overdoing it and just painting the whole thing one single color. Took some of that lighter color up there. A few of those little dashy swoops with the lighter color internally. And don't be afraid to take leaves completely outside of the plant shape. They don't even necessarily have to be connected to the plant. See there, I took a couple leaves outside of it.
All right, now I'm gonna go to my number three round and I've got some quinacridone. I just mixed a tiny point of white in there. And as you can see, I had planned on using some deep violet too, but I put that back in the tube in a few minutes and I use cad red medium instead. I'm gonna start with just like some little points, just kind of scrubbing these little areas of points of the pink throughout. They're pretty small and I'm trying to keep them as random as possible. Pick up a little point of white and I'm just adding little bits of it into this pink and sometimes it was a little bit too stark, a little too polka dotty. You can just go back over it, just kind of dash it. I'm not wiping. The more you wipe at it, the more you're going to blend it, the bigger your flowers are going to get. I just dashed it to soften it and pick up a little bit of it so I can move it to some other flowers. So you're just kind of dashing it and then it moves to another place. Just like with the leaves, you don't have to keep the pink contained to the green part of the plant. It can go off of it. We're not standing with our face right in the plant. You know, we're standing back a little bit of a distance. So there might be a little tiny stem that's kind of shooting off from the plant that's holding the flower. And you may not necessarily see that with your eye, but you would, you know, if you were standing there and actually looking at it, you would understand there's a stem that's holding the flower. And even though I may not see it. So if you get a little point of white and kind of wipe it like that, that will help you avoid some of those little polka dots that I was getting in the first place. You can add as many or as few as you like. You can add different colors, different sizes, different shapes of flowers, even leaves. You know, you could do leaves in there that are a different color of green and shape different and kind of poke out of the, the shape differently because there could be, you know, several types of plants planted in this little planter. I just went with two types of flowers and but I did them very similarly. See, just kind of dotting these little clumps. It's nothing tight. I'm not making little polka dots. I just kind of start in an area and break it up. And again, taking it outside of the green there. If you get a bit that you don't like, whether it's inside of the green shape or outside of it, I wouldn't worry about it. Don't try to fix it. Just when you come back later with the other flowers, you can cover it up or we are gonna come back and do a few more leaves. You can cover anything up with the leaves then too. So just get the color on there, just do something with it and judge it later.
Notice sometimes I'm putting the little white spots on the top edge of the flower, sometimes on the bottom edge, sometimes on the left, sometimes on the right. If you, if you don't pay attention to something like that, then you might end up doing all of your flowers exactly the same and they're all gonna look like they're kind of pointing off in one direction, which could be uncomfortable. So, you know, just change the way you're holding your brush, change the positioning of your arm, maybe stand on the opposite side of the canvas, whatever you have to do to just make sure that each of the little clumps of flowers just looks like an individual and different from all of the others. All right, that is it for the pink. I'm gonna take just a little bit of that quinacridone and mix it with some cad red medium. And I just mixed that in there so the cad red medium didn't feel so orange against the quinacridone, but it's mostly the cad red. I'm really gonna do these flowers the same way, but I'm putting a little more pressure on my brush and allowing the little spots of flowers to be larger than those magenta ones. But really I'm doing it the exact same way. But one thing you want to do is make sure that sometimes they touch the other flowers. Don't try to space everything out, you know, perfectly evenly and be afraid to let things touch because that's going to make them look stiff and flat. But if the red ones overlap the purple ones a little bit, it's going to create a little bit of depth. So do not be afraid to overlap your flowers. All right, now I'm gonna mix just a little bit of my cad yellow medium in with that quinacridone cad red mixture. Just a little bit, sorry, I know you can't see that. So it's just barely oranger, and I'm just gonna add a tiny bit of it to these red ones, really in the same way as I added the white to the magenta flowers. And when I first put this color on there, I was like, I don't know, that color's a little aggressive. Maybe I don't like that. But after I stood back and looked at it, I really liked the little pop of orange in there. So if you start doing this and your highlight color is kind of shocking to you, I encourage you to just go with it. You've already started it. Don't make one of your flowers end up looking different than the rest of them. Just go with it. And if you really don't like it, you can fix it then. And the fix will make sure that all of your flowers still look the same rather than trying to fix, you know, one or two. But yeah, I really did like this orange in here after the fact. 
And not all of the red is getting some of the orange. Some of these red flowers get a lot of it, some very little, some none at all. All right, now I'm back to my fuzzbert. It has a little extra water in it and I'm picking up some white. I kind of wanted to give the illusion of some teeny, teeny, teeny white flowers in there like baby's breath. So I'm gonna kind of splatter just a few little bits with some white. You could skip this if you want. I just thought that it kind of helped to give. I was gonna tap that out and then realized, nope, I can put a leaf over it. But I just wanted to give, like I said, the illusion of some teeny little white flowers growing in there too. It's okay if some of these things get really splattery looking. Don't worry about that. Like that, not worried about that little streaky splattery bit. and it's okay if it overlaps the window. Back into my green. I'm gonna mix up a lighter green this time. And I did start putting a little bit of white in it and that was not right. So I, I quickly abandoned that, but this is gonna be a nice pale green. And we're just gonna add some detail leaves. This color was a little light and really it was because of the white in it that I ended up not liking it. It was too stark of a change from the green that I was working on. So you can see I'm kind of struggling there trying to figure out what to do with it. It was just way too pale, even for down here where it was lighter. So I'm gonna go a little bit darker. I'm not gonna add any white into it anymore. And that ended up being much better, much, much better. So I can cover up things I didn't like. I'm just adding some shape into those interior leaves. Again, changing the color a little bit every time I go back for more paint and taking, definitely taking some of these leaf shapes outside of the overall shape. And again, I'm using my filbert, but the way I'm getting that shape is by using the edge of the filbert. See, I just covered up that little splatter. So remember, you can do a painting like this however you like. You can do the plant and the window and the texture on the wall and all of the things however you like. What I recommend you do is just get online and look at a bunch of stock images of, you know, different, different window scenes like this. That's what I did. I went and looked at several, several different 
stock images of window scenes and I took little ideas from each one that I liked, you know, the the type of wall, the shape of a window, the color of a wall, and and so on, and kind of Frankensteined my own scene together out of out of a bunch of them. So, you know, hop online and, and see what you find and maybe use my painting techniques as a base and then create your own scene however you want it to be. just a little bit lighter and by lighter I mean more yellow I'm not adding white we're just gonna punch a few really bright leaves in there and then we'll be done with with the leaves All right, back to my number three round, just getting some Payne's Gray, and I'm just gonna plop a little tiny black, well, a Payne's Gray point into the center of a lot of these red ones. Just kind of helps anchor them a little bit more, make them look like a, a larger flower, and it helps differentiate them from the red ones, or the pink ones, a little bit more. Looks like different types of flowers. And that is really all there is to it. So I would love to say thank you so much to my awesome sponsor, Fredericks, for providing these canvases. And I have some other Fredericks canvases coming up for you other than canvas pads. So I'm excited to share that with you. And thank you to all of you who watch and paint along with me every single week. It means more to me than you even know. So I will see you next time.